Okay, so let's welcome uh, Ben Meng Li. Thank you very much. So, uh, just an introduction, my name is Wei Meng. So, uh, if you cannot sleep at night, always go to my website and take a look at what I've been up to. So, uh, basically, my, my focus is on uh, developers training. So, I want to make difficult topics easy to understand. And that's why I'm interested in a lot of different topics. So some things that you might have read before, um, many, many years ago, I wrote a book on iOS 5. I know this is donkey years ago. And then you might have read my book on Android. And this is my most recent book. So uh, I recently wrote a book on Python machine learning. So if you want to know more about machine learning, uh, make sure you come to my talk tomorrow. You want to make it louder or it's good? Okay. Okay. So, so these are the things that I, I, I'm currently working on. So. Um, one of my keen interests is on mobile development. So uh, let me just explain to you the agenda for today. Now I know everybody got a long day, has a long day. So uh, I'll try to make this talk interesting, uh, nothing too technical. Um, along the way I'll crack, crack some jokes, hopefully you'll laugh. Uh, and I'm going to talk about cross-platform mobile development. So the various frameworks available. And initially I have a lot of jokes, but uh, since we are in Microsoft, so I cannot talk too much uh, jokes about Microsoft. So, and I will get you started with Flutter. So, how many of you have actually started with Flutter? That means you have written your your first uh, Hello World. Okay, uh, very good. How about the rest of you? New, totally new to, to, to Flutter. Very good. You will believe what I say. Okay. So, and then along the way, I'll show you some demos, and hopefully, I'll share with you my experience of learning Flutter. Uh, how to get started, how to actually understand what's going on, and hopefully that will leave you with the motivation to, to want to learn uh, more. Now, so today we have uh, two major platforms to, to develop for. So we have iOS, we have Android. And in the past, we have a lot of operating systems. We have a lot of mobile OS. I'm not too sure whether you remember some of this yet. So you have Symbian. So anybody remember Symbian? How many of you have programmed in Symbian before? Before you put up your hand, it's going to reveal how old you are. <laughs> so okay. So uh, C++. Those are the painful days, C++. Okay. Symbian was uh, owned by who? Which company? Nokia. 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 And then you, you read about the history of Nokia, and then yeah, that, that's what. And, and that's why they are finished. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, besides Symbian, you have uh, Windows Phone, uh, and and Windows Phone died, I think, somewhere sometime last year, right? Which is really a shame, uh, because in the past I wrote a lot of uh, Windows uh, mobile applications. Uh, how many of you remember the .NET Compact Framework days? .NET Compact Framework. No, nobody in this room knows about .NET Compact Framework. I don't believe this. You guys look very old. So. <laughs> no? Okay. Okay. So, uh, back in the, in the good old days, we have things, this thing called Windows uh, Pocket PCs. Remember? Windows Pocket PC, Windows Smartphones, and then you write your, your .NET Compact Framework applications, and then you can do things like Bluetooth, send SMS uh, messages, so on and so forth. So those were the days, until uh, 2007, something happened your iPhone came about, and, and, and the rest is history. And then you have this thing called BlackBerry OS. Okay, so I'm sure you know about BlackBerry, so uh, let's not talk about BlackBerry anymore. Uh, you know this thing called Bata and Kaizen. Heard of this? Which company? Samsung. 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 So Samsung has been a long time supporter of the Android operating system. But Samsung realized that, hey, if they keep on relying on Google for the Android operating system, um, they are not going to make most of their money. So uh, Samsung, as a device manufacturer, they make the money from hardware. But once they sell you the hardware, that's it. That's the end of the, the <coughs> revenue stream. So Samsung, for a long time, has been trying to have their own operating system. And they, they, they recently has this thing called Tizen, which allows you to actually write applications for the platform. So, uh, but interestingly, they chose a very interesting language to, to program. So nowadays, most, most people are familiar with, with what language? Java, 
C sharp. And then Samsung realized that the life of a developer is not challenging enough. So it says, you shall develop in C++. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and where is Tizen now? Where is Tizen now? I think it's in some TVs. Okay, I think it's focused on, on TV. And then, um, how about Pada? Uh, I, know, I have no idea where is it now. I think it's there. And then you have this thing called Sailfish. Heard of this? There's a OS called Sailfish. Never mind. <laughs> okay. Now, so today we have iOS, we have uh, Android. Are we going to see a third one? And especially with the kind of things that are happening uh, in the mobile space uh, for the past few weeks. So, uh, is there going to be a new platform? I'm sure you, for the, for the past few weeks, you have been seeing this logo, Huawei. Okay? And from what I understand, Huawei has been internally developing an OS called Hongmeng. So, uh, this is the Chinese character for, for, for the code name. So, they have been preparing for these days for a long, long time. They know that one day, if Google would to, to prevent them from having access to Android, they would be dead. So, internally, they have been developing a new operating system, and they are waiting for this day where Google cuts off Android from them, and they will have their own uh, OS. And from what I read yesterday in, in the latest report, uh, it, it, it claims that they're going to be uh, released next month. So you are going to see new devices running the uh, Hong Meng uh, operating system, probably in all in Chinese characters, which you might not understand. Anyway, so uh, it was rumored to be built with the help of former Nokia engineers, and uh, it will gradually replace Android, used on smartphones, TVs, uh, automobiles, wearables, uh, and compatible with all Android apps. So I'm, I'm really excited to see this. And, and I want to see how the, the compatibility works. But it's going to be an uphill task. It's going to be very, very difficult. It needs a lot of traction to succeed. So uh, you need to have, a, first of all, you need to have a very strong developer's tool chain uh, for developers to start writing apps for you. And your documentation must be in English, at least. So, so only then can developers embrace your operating system. But from, from history, if you look at the history of uh, the other competitors, you look at um, Microsoft, you look at Blackberry, you look at all the other products, I, I think this is very difficult. So will it succeed? I, I don't know. But maybe with the determination of the Chinese, maybe we can see something uh, new. So uh, it must open up to the non-Chinese speaking world. So if you keep it within, within China itself, it's going to be very difficult for them to be a dominant operating system. <coughs> so you need to have a strong uh, app store. So, but if they say that you, it is fully compatible with all the Android apps, then it's going to be a different story. So, and Microsoft and Amazon has already struggled for years. So if you look at Amazon, how many of you have a uh, Kindle? You know, Kindle runs a modified version of Android. So, so Amazon has the same ambition. Amazon wants to have its own operating system, and even Amazon today is um, struggling. So that's so much for the so-called potential third platform in, in the market. So let's talk about cross-platform development. Now, for the past few years, we have seen a lot of uh, solutions appearing in the market. So. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with hybrid apps or web apps. So there are apps called uh, PhoneGap application. You have Ionic, and I, I, I believe some of you are, are familiar with this. So you might have written your PhoneGap application, you have written your Ionic, and then most recently there's something called the Progressive Web Apps, PWA, which is gaining a lot of traction. So, but all these are not pure native apps. They are not pure native apps. They are third-class citizens or second-class citizen on the mobile platform. So what most people want is an application that runs natively on the platform itself. You want to be a first-class citizen. Now, in order to be a first-class citizen on the mobile platform, you have to go and use the, the tools provided by the platform manufacturer. So in the case of iOS, you need to use Xcode. How many Objective-C developers are there in, in this class? Or you guys got a very high threshold for pain. 
<laughs> so anyway, I, I really respect Objective C developers. It's not an easy language to, to, to learn, and, and all the square brackets, all the message passing is, is crazy. And for Android, you have used Android Studio, and um, today you now back 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 to the Xcode. You can use uh, Objective C. You can use Swift. For Android Studio, you can use Java and you can use Kotlin. And I think most of the people here in this class are, are eager to, to, to learn more about Kotlin. Now, besides the Xcode and Android Studio, you also have what we call cross-platform development frameworks. And in particular, of interest to, to, to a lot of people as well as myself is uh, the following. Uh, Xamarin, which is from Microsoft, React Native, as well as Flutter. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each platform. So Xamarin. So it is founded by the people who actually created Mono. And the biggest draw of uh, Xamarin is that it uses C Sharp. So you don't have to struggle with the, the really awful language called Objective-C. Okay? And, and you might not like Java. How many of you actually like Java? Okay, very good. Nobody likes Java. <laughs> so now it is owned by Microsoft. So Microsoft bought over Xamarin. Okay? Now, what is the real reason for Microsoft buying over Xamarin? One of the reasons is because they want Visual Studio for the Mac. They want to have the development environment on the Mac. So, so they bought over uh, 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 Xamarin. So instantly, Microsoft has got a development foothold on the Mac platform. Now, Xamarin has got the following components. It has got four main components. Um, you can use it to develop iOS. You can develop, uh, use it to develop Android apps. You can use it to develop Mac apps. Not many people are interested in this. Okay? So the Mac platform is pretty uh, limited. And you have something that is really, really, truly cross-platform, and that is Xamarin Forms. Now, so how Xamarin works? Let's talk about Xamarin.Android. So if you are a c -sharp developer, you want to write your Android application, the easiest way is to use Xamarin.Android. And basically, you can write your, your business logic, like your database code, your web services, whatever, in c -sharp. And at the UI layer, you can use c -sharp to create your Android UI. But the downside to this is that you still have to get acquainted with the platform details. So for example, if you are developing Android apps, you still need to know what is a, an activity, what is a fragment, what is a service, what is an intent. The only draw for using Xamarin.Android is you can use c -sharp. Other than that, there isn't really too much of a, of a, of a uh, benefit. Now, same thing on the iOS side. On the iOS side, uh, you can use c and but the, the downside is that you still need to do things like storyboard, you still need to, to uh, get acquainted with uh, the various views on, on iOS. So this solution is good for people who really eat c -sharp for breakfast, and they, they hate to learn something new. Now, after that comes along Xamarin Forms. So Xamarin Forms promises to write once, debug everywhere. No, no, write once, run everywhere. So, in the good old days, uh, one of the earliest promises of uh, Java. When was Java launched? 1995. 1995. Where were you in 1995? <laughs> were you born yet? <laughs> okay. So one, one of the earliest promises of Java was write once, run everywhere. Part of this slogan, but in reality is write once, debug everywhere. Okay. So using Xamarin Forms, you have what we call a unified UI. So instead of getting yourself uh, acquainted with things like activities, fragments, so and so forth, you have your set, own set of uh, UI. And what it does is that it will translate whatever UI you have created here into the native platform's equivalent. So that way, you can actually create applications that behave just like a native app. Uh, in fact, it is a native app. So this is the promise of Xamarin Forms. So if you are uh, from 
the Microsoft can, your company has got a lot of Microsoft uh, users, a lot of Microsoft technologies, Xamarin, Xamarin form is really good for you. I have to say that because I'm in Microsoft. So. Next thing, next thing. Uh, React Native. How many of you are actually React Native developers? Hopefully after this session you can actually think of jumping ship. <laughs> React Native. So it's based on a JavaScript framework for writing native iOS and Android applications. So if you know React, React Native is very, very similar. It, 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 it's basically it's a, it's a cousin of uh, React. So how do you write React Native applications? You write them using a mixture of JavaScript, CSS, and what you call JSX, JavaScript extension. Another name for spaghetti code. So you write your, your UI, you write your business logic, all embedded together called JSX. And React Native would translate your UI markup to native UI elements. Hence your app is a pure native app. So this is one of the biggest draw of React Native. Now, what about the current version of React Native? Can I just check with those guys who are familiar? What's the current version of React Native? It's not even 1.0. I think it's 0.50 something, right? So the good thing about this is that when you go for an interview, a job interview for a, as a React Native developer, the employee cannot ask for a 10-year working experience with React Native. <laughs> it's, it's such a new technology. So I think it's about 3-4 years old. So now this is how React Native works. So you write your code using JSX. So you have a mixture of XML plus JavaScript. And then you have something called a Metro Bundler. So when you compile your code, your code will actually, uh, the Metro Bundler will spew up one whole set of JavaScript content. And the JavaScript content is actually run by the iOS uh, shell. So you have an application, it's an it's a, it's a empty shell. And it loads that JavaScript through the JavaScript call and it converts into the native UI elements. So, so for example, in React Native, you will specify view. If you run it on iOS, it will be translated to UI view. And if you run it on Android, it will be translated to, to, to view on the uh, Android platform. So that's React Native. Now, so we have Xamarin, we have React Native, and then just, I think sometime last year, uh, Google came out with this thing called Flutter. So what is Flutter? So if you know, the, the good news is that if you know React Native, Flutter is very similar to React Native. Okay? Now, what is Flutter? Flutter is Google's portable UI toolkit for building natively compiled mobile, web, and desktop apps. So the focus here is that it not only supports mobile, it also supports web and desktop apps. Okay? But the bad news is that you've got to learn a new language. Since you're going to learn Kotlin anyway, so what, what's the problem with learning one more programming language called Dart? Heard of this language called Dart? Okay? So, but the good news is the, the language itself is very similar to C Sharp, Swift, Kotlin, and all most modern programming languages. So today, uh, everybody wants to have their own language. So, Anyway, so it contains the following major components. So it has got this thing called the Flutter engine, which is written in C++, and it provides very low-level rendering uh, using Google's uh, Scala graphics library. It has got a foundation library, and it has got widgets, which is what we're going to talk about uh, in the second part of this talk. Now, Flutter has got something called platform widgets. Now, the main difference here is that unlike Xamarin and React Native, Flutter does not use the platform's native widgets. Meaning, if you have a, a, a view, it does not directly use the view on the platform. So it does its own rendering. It does its own painting of the widget. And instead, Flutter provides a set of widgets that allows you to target material design. So if you are writing an application that runs on the platform, you can use material design. Or if you want to 
target specifically iPhones, then you can use something called the Cupertino widget, which I'll show you in, in a moment. So, so how Flutter works? So as a Flutter developer, you spend your time writing Dart applications, Dart code. So your Dart code would consist of things called widgets, and that's where you paint your UI. You, you, you want to build your UI of your application. And the widget is being rendered on the platform's canvas. And any events are being sent back to your widgets so that your code can interact with the widgets. Now, Dart can also go through the platform channels to access the platform API. So if you want to access the camera, you want to access the sensors, you want to access locations, you can do that through the platform channels. Now, here is a quick comparison of all the major frameworks available today as a, as a available to you as a developer. Now, if you purely want to develop for iOS and you don't want to care about the other platforms, you simply go to this path. So go iOS from Apple, uses Objective-C or Swift, and you use Xcode, and it has got the following package manager. It uses Swift package manager or the Google ports, and the UI is native. That means you write a pure native application. Now, if you are an Android diehard, you only want Android, then go with this path. You can choose Java, you can use Kotlin. Um, you use Android Studio, and the package manager is a Gradle or Maven, and your UI is native, pure native application. Now, if you want something that's cross-platform, uh, today most developers, most developers do not have time to maintain two code bases. They want to have one single code base, that runs on multiple platforms. So uh, this is the normal path that people want to go. So if you if you are a C sharp diehard, then go this path. Use Visual Studio, your favorite. And okay, never mind. And it's got a package manager called how do you pronounce this word? Nugget. Nugget or nugget? Nugget. Nugget. Okay. And. The, 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 the end result of the product that you develop is also pure native app. So, so that's Xamarin. React Native, if you, if you trust Facebook, do you trust Facebook? <laughs> you use ECMAScript, which is ES6 JavaScript. ECMAScript is just a very fanciful name for JavaScript. Uh, you use Visual Studio Code, um, and you use the NPM. So if you know Node.js, NPM is your best friend and you develop native apps. Now, you are left with Flutter, and maybe that's the reason why you're here. So, in Google, we trust. So you use this language called Dart, and you use Visual Studio Code, and they have their own package manager called Pop, and the UI is rendered. Okay, so this is not a disadvantage, this is a really an advantage, because the UI rendering is pretty fast. Okay, so we have gotten uh, the major frameworks all covered. So let's talk about this language called Dart. So it's a programming language developed by Google. And in my opinion, having tried all these various languages, um, my personal feeling is that it's very similar to, to Java, C Sharp, Swift, Kotlin. So um, I think we have reached a point where all programming languages are almost the same. Okay, so I heard the next major programming language is English. So you just speak into a microphone, they will write the code for you automatically. So that's that's the next generation of right? AI. Now, for development, that uses just-in-time compilation. So you can do something called hot reload. I'll show you later on. And for release, it uses ahead-of-time compilation so that you can compile to fast native code. And one other advantage of Dart is that it can be compiled to JavaScript to be used on the web. So that's something that is really, really uh, exciting about uh, Flutter. Now, I know learning a new language is a daunting task. So what I've done is that I have summarized the syntax. So if you do not want to, 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 to <coughs> go and read a book on, on, on Dart, uh, you can take note of this URL. Uh, this is a cheat sheet that I have summarized the 
all the major important points about the language. So you don't have to really uh, read the book from beginning to the end. So print this out um, and then stick it onto your wall and then whenever you need this, you can refer to it. Okay? Uh, the, the one bad news for Dart is that you still have to use semicolon. You know, most modern programming languages don't use semicolon anymore, right? Like, like your Swift, uh, your Kotlin doesn't use semicolon, but for Dart, you have to use semicolon. Uh, uh, one good news about Dart 2.0 is that you no longer need to use the new keyword when you instantiate a new class. Okay? So it's finally catching up with the modern uh, programming languages paradigm. Demo. Okay, let's do a demo. <laughs> So I'm going to create a very simple project using Flutter. So Flutter create hello world, enter. So it will go ahead and create all the necessary files. And the best way to, to edit uh, or write your, your Flutter uh, application is either through Visual Studio Code or you can use Android Studio. So personally, I, I, I prefer Visual Studio. So uh, let's go to Visual Studio and let's open up this project. Let's go to Hello World, open up. Now, as in any platform, whenever you create a Hello World, there will be tons of uh, files generated. Uh, in React Native, when you create a Hello World, how many files are generated? One? Somebody say one? <laughs> How many files are created when you create a Hello World application in React Native? 40,000. 40,000? 200,000. <laughs> because of NPM, they, they actually download a lot of, of these files. And, and when I was doing my React Native project, so I was preparing for the course material for a React, React Native course. So I got 15 labs all together. So each lab I had a separate project. So I created all these projects and I put all these projects in my Dropbox folder. Guess what happened? It killed my Dropbox. <laughs> they couldn't synchronize anymore. So all the files are stuck with Dropbox. And when I contacted Dropbox, they said, oh no, we, we, they, they tell me about all this thing about symbolic links, so on and so forth. If you use Dropbox, you know all this from. So, so one word of caution is that if you, if you develop uh, React Native apps and you use Dropbox, don't mix them together. Now, now there are a lot of files available here. So th let me just highlight the important ones. So the Android folder that you have here contains the Android shell, meaning it's an empty application and it is going to act as the shell to bootstrap your Flutter application. The iOS folder here contains your iOS project that is going to bootstrap itself and load your application on the iPhone. Now, as a developer, the one that I'm really interested in is in the lib folder main.dart. Now, when I first learned this, I got a shock of my life. A simple Hello World application in 2019 takes two, three pages. Okay? Now, don't do this. Uh, in, my, in my opinion, now, this sample code has got a lot of concepts, which is very, very good for understanding how a Flutter application works, but it is not ideal for beginners. So, what I do is click everything, delete it. Okay? And delete it. And let me just show you one example. So I've prepared something. So I'm going to put it inside here. So this is the easiest way to understand how a dark, uh, uh, Flutter application works. So the main starting point of your application is the main function. And it loads something called run app. So the run app takes in a widget. So your text here is a widget. So a widget is your UI element. Okay, now let's see how it works. So without all the stuff there, 
I'm going to run this on my iPhone simulator. So my simulator is already up here. So I'm going to CD into the Hello World application, Flutter, run. So the first time it's run, it will compile. And then it will deploy this application onto the iPhone simulator. So you can take a rest now, uh, wait for you to compile. I think we are almost done. There you go, it's installing here. There you go, this is my hello world. Wait. It's up there. Okay, so it's up there. So, uh, not, not to worry. So let me let me go back and do it step by step. Okay. So I have mentioned the structure. So this is the lib where we have the main dot dot. This is the main entry point for my application. And I have something called pubspec dot yaml. Something interesting. What does y a m l stand for? <laughs> what does y a m l stand for? Yet another yet another markup language. So. Now, in, in React Native and in Flutter, what most of the things that you want to do have already been created by your fellow developers, people who actually write libraries and share it on GitHub. Okay? Now, in the case of React Native, they, it, it, it uses NPM, and in the case of uh, 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 Flutter, they use pub. So, most of the things that you want to do, most of the UI that you want to create, most of the create fanciful UI that you want to, you want to use when you develop, Chances are it has already been developed by somebody. Okay? So, whatever library you want to use, just go into the pubspec.yaml, type in the, the library, the package that you want to use, save in, in, in Visual Studio Code, and Visual Studio Code will automatically go and fetch the library. Okay? So, I'm going to show you some demos later on. And you have your iOS, you have an Android uh, shell. So, you can run a Flutter project very easily. You can look at the different emulators that you have. You can launch a particular emulator. In this case, uh, you can launch your iOS simulator. And then you just CD into your CD into your, your project folder and do a Flutter run. And it will automatically look at the emulators, simulators that are running. It will automatically deploy them. So this is a bare bone Flutter project. So as I mentioned, the run app has got a widget argument, and this argument will become the root widget for the whole app. Now, those of you who have uh, already uh, looked at some videos on Flutter, you would have come across something called hot reload. Hot reload basically means that when you go and modify your code, you don't have to recompile, redeploy your application on the simulator. So, hot reload can only work. It will not work on the root widget, just to let you know. So uh, I'll, I'll show you a demo later on, but just to, to let you know. So how do, I, how do I make it more interesting? So that's the next thing I want to do. Now, instead of having my text as the first root widget, I want to enclose this within a center. So I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to replace this. So my center now has got a child, it is called text. And what I want to do now is I am going to my command prompt. I'm going to do a quit and then I'm going to run this. There you go. So your text is now in the center of the screen. And if you were to uh, change the orientation of this simulator, it will actually flip upright. How do you actually change the orientation of the simulator? You take a laptop, you just <laughs> turn the screen, right? So, so there you go. Are you impressed? <laughs> Never mind. Okay, I, I got more things coming up. I think it looks like my, my session will have to end at 9 o'clock. So. <laughs> now, 
In, in Flutter, UI are represented as widgets. So widgets was inspired by React. So widgets are basically the UI element. They describe how the view should be should look like, and given its current configuration and state. So when the state changes, the widget rebuilds its description, and the framework compares that with the previous description of the of, of the widget, and to determine the amount of changes that they need to update on the screen. So this is one of the the nice things about React Native uh, when it comes to updating the UI. So. We have already seen the use of the center widget to, to centralize the, the, the text uh, widget. Let's talk about containers. So what happens if we want to draw some custom uh, images, custom some shapes? So we can use the container. So let's uh, change this. So let's go to center and add in the container. Here, and I'm going to paste it in here. There you go. I'm going to quit this, and I'm going to run this again. Now, usually you don't have to quit and reload, but in this case, because I'm starting the UI from scratch, I'm, I'm having my root element up there, so that's why uh, uh, it's going to be a little bit slower. Usually, you don't have to do that. You can do a hot reload. So there you go. So instead of having a text, I have a container that I can paint it in, 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 in yellow. Now what happens if within this particular uh, container, I want to display some text? Yes, I can. So I'm going to put a child inside this height, inside this uh, container. I'm going to quit. I'm going to run this again. So, I have my text within this container. So, if I want to change my, my width, I can change it to 300. And then I can reload this. I can start this again. There you go. Now, if you observe, this is not a material app. It doesn't have the look and feel of a material app. It's, it's not an iOS app because it doesn't look like an iOS app. We want to wrap this as a, as a material app or as a Cupertino app. So, what we can do here is that we can actually use the material app here. And I am going to change this whole thing to material app. And in the material app, I have a home, and I have an app bar, and the app bar has got a title, and the content of the material app has got a text here. So I'm going to save this, and I'm going to run this again. So now this is a material app. Are you impressed? <laughs> okay. Now, okay, you, you guys are very difficult to please. So, okay, so let's add some things inside this uh, material app, right? So we are going to put in the body and we're going to overwrite this and save this. So now in my material app, I have the container that we have painted earlier on with the text that is inside here. And now to, to, to some people, uh, the, the, the act of creating the UI is a little tedious. You have to create the center, you specify the child, and then you have to specify all, all, the, all those things. Uh, compared to things in React Native where you can use your, 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 your particular layout and then you have your, your your code to do the, 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 the business logic. 
So after a while of creating the UI using Flutter, you realize that this is actually much more efficient and, and you can actually create a lot of very, very beautiful UI. Now, what happens if you say that, okay, I, I'm, I don't care about material apps. I only want to care, uh, I only want to, uh, my, my app to look like an iPhone app. Not a problem. So you change this whole thing to a Cupertino app. They really call this the Cupertino app. So I just changed this whole thing It's called Cupertino. Save this. Run this. Now it looks like an iPhone application. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is what we have done earlier on. So material app. So so the material app class represents an application that uses material design. So it's, it's not just for Android. It can also be applied to, to iPhone. And if you if you if you if you want the the app to look purely like an iPhone application, you can apply the Cupertino app class. So it implements the iOS uh, design language based on Apple's human design guidelines. Now, next important thing is stateless widgets and stateful widgets. So there are two main types of widgets that you have to play with when you're building your application in Flutter. One is called a stateless widget. As the name implies, stateless widget basically allows you to paint on the screen and then you don't expect to change the look and feel after that. You, you don't expect to, to update certain things on, on the UI. Stateful, on the other hand, allows you to actually modify your UI during runtime so that you can actually update this when somebody clicks on a, 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 a button, or, or for example. So, how to create a stateless widget? Uh, very straightforward, to create a stateless widget, uh, give a name to this new widget class, extend the class from stateless widget, and implement the build method with one argument of type build context and return type of widget. So this is the template. So in this example, I have a widget called my custom widget, extends stateless widget. I override this build method, and I'm going to add in the code to return a widget. So here's my example. So I have a widget called my custom widget. I have a constructor here. And in my stateless widget, I basically have a center, I have a container, and within this container, I have a child, center, text. I want to display hello based on the value that's being passed into this particular widget. And how do I actually make use of that? In my run app, I could basically specify my widget here. So, let me show you one example. So, I'm going to use that. Okay, so. So, I'm going to add in my custom widget here. And then in my run app, I'm going to add in this guy. And let me quit this. Run. And my simulator will now reload my application. There you go. So, if you look at the output, I have a hello world, which is what I have done here. And I also added a reference to my custom widget. So, 
In, in this case, uh, I pass in Riga, and within the stateless widget, I display hello Riga. Now, now I can show you something called hot reload. Now, once I have saved this, once I have deployed this, I can now change this to welcome, or no, hi. Okay, and instead of me reloading my application, stopping my application and um, running it again, I simply do a R here. I do a R, there you go. Do you catch that? Okay, so whenever I make some changes, I can do a welcome, save this, and I go back to my terminal. So don't don't blink your eyes. Look at this one. When I press R, it changes to welcome. So this is hot reload. And you may be wondering, so why is there a need to wrap this in a stateless widget? Uh, code reuse. So I can put this, I can copy this, and I can paste one more. So instead of uh, Riga, I can say Singapore. Save. And because now we, we, we are actually modifying the root, uh, root widget, so I cannot use port reload, so I have to quit this. And then I can run this again. So now I have to welcome Riga, welcome Singapore. So I can do code reuse. Okay, so let me, uh, let me try to speed up my, my, my demo. So we have seen the hot remote, uh, hot reload. Next thing, stateful widgets. Stateful widgets. Stateful widgets are a little bit more complicated. The, the, the main difference between stateful widget and stateless widget is that stateful widget allows you to actually update the look and feel, update the, the, the UI during runtime. So uh, the code for doing stateful widget is a little bit more complicated, but it's, it's not really that bad. So basically you have a class that extends the stateful widget. You don't do your UI painting here. Instead, you call another class that extends the state that is based on your stateful widget, stateful widget. Now, and you do your painting here. Now, let me show you one example, one demo. Okay, so I have a stateful widget now. So I can put this aside. I'm going to put it here, and then I have another class. So, my custom stateful widget, extend stateful widget, <coughs> and I override this particular uh, function called create state, and I basically call display state. This is what I'm going to do, draw. So, What do I want to draw? I want to draw the following. <clears throat> so let me just put it in. And let's take a look at how it looks like when you run it.
So now my stateful widget has got a touchable area here. And when I click on this, it increases the value here. On the next widget, when I click on it, it will maintain its state, it will update the UI. Now, so if you look at the code here, what my stateful widget is doing is that it is painting a text here, and it has got a gesture detector. When it detects that somebody has actually touched on this particular container here, it will fire this on tap function. And what I do here is that I set my state plus plus counter. And this counter is a state that is bound to the text of the child here. So basically this is from this counter. So whenever you change the state of counter, it will automatically update the UI here. Okay? So that is a stateful widget. So this is the explanation. If you if you want the, the, the slides, I will pass it to you. I'll find some way to, to pass it to you. So I can use the stateful widget this way. And using the gesture detector, I can detect different types of gestures. Uh, on tab or on long press and so forth. So this is how you can use a uh, stateful widget in a material app. And you can combine stateful and stateless widget in a UI. Last thing, packages. So most of the things that you need are already available in packages. So what I have here is that here are some simple packages, HTTP, Location, uh, Google Maps, Flutter. If you want to do local notifications, you can use this particular package. Now, how easy it is to uh, install packages? Let's go and use Visual Studio. And let's look at the um, pubspec.yaml. Look at this particular dependencies here. Now, if you need a particular package, let's say I need HTTP, I simply do a HTTP colon and I save. It will automatically fetch the package. So there's no need for you to do an npm install and an npm link, so and so forth. For those of you who are doing React Native. And if I want to have some other packages, I just specify the name and I can specify the, the versions that I want to, 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 to use for my package. So, uh, I have created a, a, a one or two sample apps. Uh, I want to show it to you. So, uh, the first one is locations. So this is one of the most commonly used uh, functions in a mobile app. So, let me run this. So this application basically allows you to actually get your locations. And so this is my application. When, when it loads, I will display a, a, a spinner. And then when I click on that location, it will automatically prompt me to uh, give permission to this application to access location. If I say allow, it will display the location. And of course, using a simulator, I can um, play with the different locations. I can do a freeway drive. I can do a city run, city bicycle ride, so and so forth. Okay, so that is for location services. How about Google Maps? Uh, Flutter run. So I can display Google Maps uh, very, very easily using the Google Maps uh, package. So when I first run this, 
it asks me to give permission to use the location. So when I say allow, it will display the map. And using uh, the, the, the state full widget, I can do something like this. I can click on this add marker. I can click add a, a, a push pin. Click on this. I can, I can display some information. So this is some of the things that you can, you can actually do. You can uh, develop uh, application that uses local notifications very easily. So in terms of the amount of effort that you need to put in to develop apps, uh, when, when you compare React Native and, and Flutter, uh, my personal opinion is that you actually spend less effort in, in your coding. And because a lot of all this hard work has already been, been done for you through all the various packages. Okay, so I think I am running out of time and I'm almost done. So these are the some of the packages that, that you can you can use. You, even if you access the internet, uh, download uh, info, uh, data from web services, you can use the HTTP um, and stuff like this. So these two are the demos that I've shown you, and hopefully. Uh, for the past one hour, I have given you a, a, a better picture of how you can actually start developing using Dart so, and, 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 and Flutter. Questions? Anybody got any, any questions? Yeah. Okay. So that was a great demo and I was curious, uh, like animations are the most important thing for the apps now. And there are a lot of libraries like Lobby and stuff. Uh, are there any like great libraries for animations within Flutter? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not really uh, well versed in, in, in animations, but I, from what I read, there are there are there are a lot of li libraries that allows you to actually do animations. And from what I read, you can actually uh, refresh the screen at 60, 60 pages per, per second. Mm -hmm. So so in terms of animations, there are there are a lot of libraries that allows you to do, do all those uh, animations. And and people were saying that. Writing Flutter application is very much like writing a game application where you can have a lot of animations and the, the, the refresh rate is pretty good as compared to the other mobile development frameworks. So, so definitely they are. They are. Yes? Uh, what kind of limitations do you know Flutter has? Like maybe you have uh, developed some sophisticated application and you just hit the wall and you understand that you can't do some certain things. Uh, not, not, not at this moment. At, at this moment, uh, what I'm trying to do is that uh, I'm not too sure whether you are familiar with this particular conference in 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 in, uh, in, in Norway, like NDC. So uh, I, I have developed an application for NDC conference uh, using React Native. So what I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to eat my dog food, and what I'm doing at this moment is that I'm trying to convert my application from React Native to Flutter. So. So probably I would have more to share with you maybe one month later or one two months later. So what I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to add features and things like push notifications. And from what I have done so far, things are comparatively much easier compared to React Native. So so thankfully I've not hit the the the, the, the wall yet. So but I may have more things to share with you. Let's say one month later from now. So I'm still in the process of converting. Yes. Uh, you needed to select uh, the design, material design, or the uh, iOS one. Uh, so can you like specify that you should use one for iOS and the other one for? Yes, you can. You can. So you you, you can. To wrap it two times. No, no. You, you can programmatically specify okay. uh, when you run this on on the iPhone, you want to display this as a Cupertino app and 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 vice versa. Yes, you can specify that. The end uh, package. The ADK size is larger than uh, the native uh, ADK. Uh, I I I saw the number. I I think for a for a was it an iOS app or Android app? I think the minimum Hello World app is about four point something megabyte. Four point something megabyte. I think it's a little bit bigger than a native app. Okay, uh, but not that much bigger. So it's, it's comparable. So for a React Native app, for a relatively complex application, the size that I'm getting is about 10 megabyte or 12 megabyte on iOS. So so on on, on, on Flutter is is pretty comparable. Yeah. Do 
do you know of any success stories of like running production grade apps written in Flutter? I, I, I think there are, there are. If you, if you go to Google's website, they have a page that talks about some of the so-called uh, real-world application, applications written using Flutter. Uh, I, I can't remember the, some of the names, but if you were to go to Google's website, you will be able to see a, 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 a list of applications written using Flutter. There are, there are. I think Google Analytics app is written on Flutter. Yeah. Uh, Google Analytics, okay, okay, okay. I, I, I've seen a few, but um, offhand I can't remember the, the, the names, but there are, there are. Sure. Uh, could the Flutter application be converted to web applications? That's you, a good point. You, you specify that the dot could be converted to JavaScript and UI, how about it? Um, I have not tried this yet, but I, from what I read, yes, it is possible. So, um, details, I, I, I'm not too sure, but because Google recently, in the Google I.O., they announced the support for web applications. So, uh, that's something that's pretty new, but I think that is something that is possible. I, I, unfortunately, I don't have the answer for you right now. Okay, I think we can take the questions offline, um, so that I don't delay the, the second speaker. I think he's very eager to go. He wants to talk until midnight. So. Yeah. We, we have we have do two parts. So first part is thank you for uh, your talk. Thank you very much. There's some dark chocolate. Sure. As you know, dark chocolate is called all beans. It's also tree. So in general, this is this is salad. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, we have saying in Latvia that. Uh, most important thing is that your uh, your your feet are warm, so that therefore we we, we give you that of socks. Thank you very much.